So, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting, we actually talked about this song um, when, we, when we, or soon after we met, because you were like telling me that that song actually represents a lot of like your experience in adolescence. And it's, so, it's funny for me because I always loved the song, but as a kid, of course, I didn't know what like the meaning of the words because I, I couldn't understand English. So it was it's like it's just, it was for me something for the heart and still is like the music, but it's now I also understand the text and I, I can totally say I share the same experience. It is a song, it would actually say you're happy until you go to school, until like the institution ruins you. You, you turn into somebody who is like easy to control. What I want to tell now is here is kind of something like very uh, biographical. My problems, um, my problems I have with education. And I also want to like extend education a little bit. We are just talking about universities here. But I also like want to talk about like uh, um, education in general, especially also like high school education, because I think there is also a problem. I had a very um, a difficult adolescence, it was a pretty dark world for me, like two of my siblings died when I was young and I was always um, in trouble at school, not because I was not like a bully or something like that, I was always a very friendly kid but I was extremely stubborn and never did like what the teacher told me to do and uh, I was also, but I was also in, in a constant stress um, I never had like enough time, especially at high school, at the gymnasium, for things I really liked, like drawing, reading, writing. I had no help and I almost failed actually twice high school. Yeah, after I got my master's degree in history and um, in history and, and, and German literature and art history, I uh, decided then um, to um, also get a degree in higher education and I worked at the Swiss gymnasium for like four to five years. It's a good job. It's, uh, you have a great salary in Switzerland. Um, it's, the Swiss gymnasium is very elitist, so you have like very good students usually. In some cantons, you, you only you have less than 20% of all like high school students who are going like to the gymnasium. But again, there I also <laughs> got very early on into trouble as a teacher because of grading. I was teaching um, German literature. Most of the schools, you have to reach some like average grades. And so you shouldn't be higher than this average grade, no matter how good actually your class is. And so I got into trouble because I was apparently a much too nice grader. And now I'm realizing, oh, that's why I was in trouble at high school. But it, it's so much, it's so much pressure you put people really so much like into a box that they at the end really like um, are kind of like the cog in the system and there is just not much passion behind this whole like evaluation system I mean just imagine if like you have like a, you're teaching high school you have a student who gives like an oral presentation is like nervous and is like you know in front of the, the class and you were kind of forced to give some of them like a bad grade. And there is another line from uh, C.S. Lewis I actually really um, like, and that's where I see also the problem in modern education. The task of, uh, modern, uh, of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate des deserts. So um, I always have the feeling uh, uh, the, the Swiss gymnasium is really more for like really cutting down jungles. It's more for the head and it's not for the chest. I would like to hand over to, to, to Lauren right now. I'm doing my PhD right now in um, religious studies in philosophy of religion. Um, and I also uh, went to a very unique school, um, St. John's College, where you do, where you study the great books. The problem starts before making our work public, right? It's making our work relevant. I think that ultimately the problem is reminding people that they are human, right? And that the most important thing we can do on this planet is be that. And, that, and then secondly, that this isn't something that just happens naturally. That it has to be, um, there is an educational aspect of learning 
to be human. Just to kind of uh, flesh out this point, I wanted to look at one of my favorite um, parts from the Timaeus. So um, the Timaeus, as you know, is um, Plato's um, cosmological dialogue, and um, where he really looks at the creation of the universe and um, gets very technical into like the shape of atoms, right? There are these like mixtures of different kinds of triangles that combine to uh, form different kinds of matter. It's really technical and really fun. So Plato is going into really kind of every aspect of um, the body. And um, this is uh, the first thing he looks at is sight. And so he's trying to really look at sight in a physical way, and he comes up with this idea of how sight works. And he says that sight is, um, it's, we have a fire, an internal fire or light that shoots out through our eyes, and it meets the fire or light that's outside of us in the world, and that is what creates sight. But when night comes on and the external and kindred fire departs, so meaning, so the, the light, the fire outside, um, then the stream of vision is cut off. For going forth to an unlike element, it is changed and extinguished, being no longer of one nature with the surrounding atmosphere, which is now deprived of fire. And so the eye no longer sees, and we feel disposed to sleep. For when the eyelids, which the gods invented for the preservation of sight, are closed, they keep in the internal fire, and the power of the fire diffuses and equalizes uh, the inward motion. When they are equalized, there is rest, and when rest is profound, sleep comes over us. So we're looking at how, he's looking at how, um, how, vision works and how everything is so perfectly made that even when um, the, the external light uh, is gone, we have these eyelids that perfectly close and we sleep. But then in the next paragraph, he goes on to um, describe why vision is so important. And I think it's unexpected um, what he comes up with. The sight, in my opinion, is the source of the greatest benefit to us. For had we never seen the stars, the sun, and the heaven, none of the words which we have spoken about the universe would ever have been uttered. But now the sight of day and night and the months and revolutions of the years have created number and have given us the concept of time and the power of inquiring about the nature of the universe. And from this source we have derived philosophy, than which no greater good ever was or will be given by the gods to mortal man. Philosophy requires a resistance to this natural sleep, right? Our body is um, created so that as soon as the light is extinguished, we close our, our eyes and sleep. But it is resistance to this natural um, process that makes philosophy possible. Philosophy, right, life, uh, the, the, the height of human life isn't going, something that happens naturally. It requires this resistance to nature. And I think that this is completely forgotten today. And you can go on living in a certain way, but you're not going to um, reach the fullness that it is to be a human being without this resistance uh, to nature. That should be what education is.